I spend a lot of time thinking about the end of the world. And I don't mean in a we're doomed sort of way, although, you know, not looking great. Instead, I think about it in a what would I do sort of way. If I managed to be one of the few people left after whatever terrible catastrophe ended life as we knew it, would I be able to survive for long? It's undoubtedly morbid, but there's something about the post-apocalyptic life that's kind of alluring. It's interesting to consider what things would be like if all the social structures we've come to rely on collapsed, if our primary drive in life was simply to survive, if we were left to form a new kind of world. And that's why I am so drawn to stories set in the post-apocalypse. They explore how people move forward as individuals and as societies after losing their way of life. While most stories set after the end of the world typically are dark and brutal, the vast majority still have a strange hope to them. And after spending most of my past month playing The Last of Us Part II and watching Kipo in The Age of Wonder Beasts, I've been thinking a lot about the different ways hope can be explored in post-apocalyptic tales, and also how a lot of the same conclusions can be reached in dramatically different ways. And I think comparing and contrasting these two properties in particular illustrates that perfectly. Despite one being a game that very much earns its M rating, and the other being a Y7 cartoon made by DreamWorks Animation, the two have a surprising amount in common. They both are set in worlds where it has become dangerous for humans to simply exist, they both feature the city's reclaimed by nature aesthetic that I cannot get enough of, and they both have leads with genetic mutations that set them apart from other survivors. Also, Ellie and Kipo both play guitar. Most importantly though, the two stories examine a lot of the same ideas about hope, humanity, and how those two things are affected by the drive to survive. Of course, The Last of Us Part II is an exhausting journey where the main character trudges relentlessly through a world that seems hell-bent on breaking people down to their worst selves, and Kipo is a light-hearted jaunt where the main character is fueled by unyielding optimism and the desire to correct the mistakes of those who came before her. I won't be discussing heavy spoilers for The Last of Us Part II or Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts, but I will talk about some specific story moments, examine general themes, and show various clips of each. So if you want to go into either of them blind, consider this your warning. Also, I will be spoiling the first Last of Us game, so if you're one of the 12 people who still doesn't know what happens in that one, beware. Anyway, let's talk about how The Last of Us and Kipo in the Age of Wonder Beasts explores hope and humanity in the post-apocalypse. In our normal lives, when we think about hope, it's rooted in the future. It's about growing as people and as communities to make a life in a world that is better than anything we've seen before. In the post-apocalypse, though, hope is typically rooted in the past. It's about returning to a time before life became solely about survival. And this is often reflected by the communities survivors carve out for themselves. Looking at Jackson in The Last of Us Part II, we see a lifestyle unlike anything shown to us prior in the series. A humble town sitting in the middle of nowhere, almost as if it doesn't know that the world has been overrun by infected. Homes are actually homes, instead of remnants of how people used to live. Children not only are present, but they're plentiful, and they act like normal kids. There are bars, dances, movie nights. The people of Jackson have found a life similar to what things were like before the outbreak and it gives them something to believe in. They had a hope that things could return to normal, and that led to the creation of something that is truly beautiful in the midst of an ugly world. Of course, things aren't normal. They're still infected walking outside the walls. There are still hunters who want to take what they have. And really, at any moment, either could come and destroy the life that the people of Jackson have built. By the time players get to see Jackson, which is well after its formation, the hope most people hold is that they can maintain what they've built. This mentality is similar for the people of Kipo's Borough, although the normal that they arrive at is a bit further away from what life used to be like. Humans built massive bunkers underground to hide in after animals on the surface began to mutate, growing in size and intelligence for some unknown reason. When viewers enter the story, it has been around 200 years since the mutated animals, or mutes, came to be, so no one currently alive ever knew firsthand what life was like before. Regardless, the folks in the burrows live a life based around how the generations before them lived. They have markets and schools, they continue to teach the history of a world that has long since been destroyed, and of stars that no one living there will ever likely see. They find pleasure in activities like climbing and music, and they have gotten used to the sound of giant footsteps rumbling above them. 
Both Jackson and Kipos Borough are stuck in how things used to be, and neither community seems to have a good idea of what comes next. They're willing to live with the limitations of the world around them. And for the older generation, who are either happy to just have some sort of stability, or accepted long ago that the new world could only go so far, this is mostly fine. But of course, both of these stories center around the younger generation, the people trying to figure out who they are and where they belong in the world. Ellie and Kipo were both born into the post-apocalypse, and in a lot of ways, they are raised to yearn for a world they never knew. Unsurprisingly though, both of them want more than that. They want to see bigger things, and this is best exemplified through one of their shared fascinations, space. Kipo fancies herself an astronomer despite only first seeing the sky when she was 12 years old. Talking about space is one of the ways she relates to people, particularly to her father, and it's something that she constantly looks to for hope. Even before she made it to the surface, she was drawn to the stars and whatever it is that lies beyond. In the first Last of Us title, Ellie talks about how if the outbreak had never happened, she would have liked to be an astronaut. Can you imagine being up there all by yourself? Would have been cool. And this isn't just a fleeting desire. There's a section in part two where Joel takes Ellie to the Wyoming Museum of Science and History for her birthday. They explore what's left of the broken down and overgrown museum and eventually come across a space exhibit. While there, Ellie gushes about the cosmos, and at one point she even mutters under her breath that one day she'll make it to the moon. Despite there being no indication that humanity will ever get to a point of being able to travel to space again, Ellie has hope an unrealistic hope that she hasn't thought through all that far, but still a hope. This is all followed up by a scene where Joel gives Ellie a tape recording of a space launch, and for a brief moment, she imagines what it would be like to live her dream. Ellie and Kipo's fascination with space goes beyond a simple interest. It means more to them. Space is infinite. It is the promise that there must be something out there that is better than Jackson, that is better than the burrow. Space is an escape, it's a hope for a new future. While the two start off with similar points of view on life, as their respective stories go on, they take very different paths. Ellie sheds the wonder and optimism she had when she was younger and begins to view the world through an untrusting and dark lens. While most of the confrontations she finds herself in are kill or be killed situations, she almost always is the one who puts herself in those situations. And she ends up doing everything she can to dehumanize the people she's fighting against, the people she is tracking down in order to exact her revenge. It's just easier for her to ignore the fact that the people she is killing are people. On Kipo's journey to find her father, she humanizes everything, especially the non-humans. Despite constantly being given reasons to not trust others, she does. She overwhelms everyone with her goodness, and while this doesn't work in every encounter, sometimes putting her in massive trouble, she never lets these experiences break her down. She never gives up on people, no matter how many times they give her a reason to. Kipo goes through her journey with the hope of not only finding her father and friends, but also of things getting better, of being able to prove that mutes and humans don't always need to be trying to get one up on the other. She aims to change the world by being unchanging in her ideals. Ellie <laughs> doesn't. She doesn't take time to give anyone the benefit of the doubt, and she falls into the same patterns that have helped make the world as dangerous as it is, the same patterns that she learned from Joel. As Ellie loses hope in there being a purpose for it all, in there being something more, her humanity chips away. However, as Kipo finds more things to be hopeful about, her humanity rubs off on others. Both characters are also tied to a more global idea of hope the hope of reversing what brought about the apocalypse in the first place. With Ellie, it's her immunity to the cordyceps infection, an immunity that the fireflies believe could be the key to the cure. And with Kipo, it's her genetic mutation that gives her jaguar-like qualities, placing her as part human and part mute. The science behind Kipo's mutation was originally intended to reverse the mutations of animals on the surface, and that is still very much the hope and plan of action for many humans in the world. However, Kipo's parents recognize the ethical dilemma of taking agency away from intelligent life forms that have created societies and human-like lives for themselves. So they decided to do something a little wild and create a new life form. Kibo's existence is the decision to change humans instead of the world around them. She represents a future for humanity that is not just returning to the past, it's making something new. This kind of future isn't an option in the world of The Last of Us, as the infected can't be reasoned with in the way mutes can. The best possible future for the people of the world is to return 
return things to the way they were. It's never really stated how effective a vaccine would be, but at the very least, it would be a step in a safer direction. What matters most about the cure, though, at least in the confines of the characters we care about, is that in order to obtain it, Ellie would have to die. We never really get to know for sure if this is a choice she would be able to make, as the option is taken away from her, first by the Fireflies who plan to do the operation without her consent, and then by Joel, who killed most of them and then lied to her about it. Ellie wanted her life to mean something. Her belief that everything she's been through can't be for nothing is the basis of her hope. So when she learns that it all was for nothing, it shifts her view of the world. And in The Last of Us Part Two, when she learns that it was actually all for nothing because of Joel's actions, it deteriorates her view of things even further. Her opportunity to make a choice that could save the world was taken away from her. So despite her life still having value, and there even being a chance that someone else out there could create a cure, she pushes that down. She buries it because the idea of having her hopes dashed again is too painful to risk happening. This is the opposite of Kipo, who is never afraid to have hope, because most of her so far have paid off. Hope is a weird thing. It's necessary for survival. It acts as a beacon one can follow in order to live a good life. However, hope is also dangerous. It can get those with too much of it into trouble. And also, when a hope becomes an impossibility, it can cause people to lose who they are. And all of these ideas are what I think about when running through my end of the world scenarios. What would I have hope in? Would I be looking to return to the past or establish some new future? Would I still have big dreams no matter how impossible they seem in the new world. Would I be like Ellie or would I be like Kipo? Hopefully, I will never actually have to find out, but I will always wonder who I might become if everything I've ever known and relied on was completely thrown out of balance. And speaking of balance, have you ever been listening to music on a pair of earbuds and wondered what it would be like if there was more bass? Well, luckily, this video's sponsor Raycon has a solution to that problem. Raycon makes high quality wireless earbuds that sound as great as other premium brands, but start at about half the price. I listen to stuff constantly, so it's nice to have a pair of earbuds that are comfortable, sound good, and don't have any cords. Their latest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are great. They have six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, tons of bass, a more compact design that gives a nice noise isolating fit, and they also come in new fun colors. And if you go to buyraycon.com slash resbutin, you can get 15% off your order. The link is in the description. Raycon makes great earbuds, and I've legitimately used mine every day since I've gotten them. So if you're in the market for a really awesome pair, you should check them out. Anyway, thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring this video. I appreciate you all for watching. It means a lot, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you have a great day, and or night and I'll see you in the next one.